Tuesday night class, teaching from chapter 3 and 4 in the Job's body skeletal system. Alrighty then. Any questions from this chapter? Any questions? Think about why are we starting with this? Why are we starting with the connective tissue when we look at the skeletal system? Any ideas? what you read? Why, why am I asking you to read this chapter? Why are we starting with connective tissue when we're looking at the skeletal system? What do you think? Well, what's the skeletal system made of? Connective tissue. This is not a trick question, okay? <laughs> it's not a trick question. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. All right, some of the things that you should take from this is, well, the first thing that he talks about is water bags. I talked about water bags. Um, that's what you have connective tissue for, is you're just a big bag of water, right? Water wanted to be able to walk around, so it made a membrane, so it would be able to do that. And if, if, the, if the organism is small enough, if it's just a few cells, diffusion, everything can get it in and out, right? Doesn't, you don't need any more complicated ways for fluids to go in and out. But when you get bigger, you get more complex, then you still have to get the fluid in and get the fluid out. So the connective tissue is the little dividing of segment to segment, but also a way for everything to get around in the body. That, that's how everything gets around, is through the connective tissue and the ground substance in the connective tissue. Who can tell me what the matrix is? Who's, what's the matrix? Huh? No, we talked about this last night. What's the matrix? It's collagen fibers and some more um, I was going to show you a chart to show you how very similar our blood is to salt water. Just a few molecules difference. In fact, a scientist once filtered the, the salt water, took all the plasma out of a dog and put the salt water in and the dog <coughs> couldn't even act like he didn't even tell the difference. That's how similar it is. Very, very similar. Um, yeah. <laughs> so is your blood alkaline or acidic? When we learn this stuff, we have to learn the concepts behind it. The concepts behind it. Is salt water alkaline or acid? Do you know? That was in, you should have done that in the digestive system. That's where you kind of get into that. But, huh? It is not acid. It's alkaline. It's alkaline, okay? Your, I'll give you a chart. You don't have your, your chart for your pH. Where's my black one? No, 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 no. The body is not slightly acid. No, it's not. <coughs> um, uh, alkalinity. Alkalinity. Or we sometimes call it base. Right? An acid on a scale. Who knows what the scale is? Seven. <clears throat> what is seven? Seven, neutral. Neutral. seven is neutral. Okay, everything below seven is acid. Everything above up to 14 is alkaline. What are the colors associated with this? Is this blues and this is reds, or is this reds and that's blues? Alkaline is blues. Alkaline is blues. So it's, it's orange and red down here and blue and green and purple up there, right? So you can buy a little, little pen, like a little uh, eyebrow pencil, and you can test the alkalinity on your skin. So you buy a product and you don't know the alkalinity of it, you can put it on your skin and then rub that pen on it and you can see if it's alkaline or acid. Because some things are going to be good for you and some things aren't. And, and you may have a condition, like if you have acne, what would be a good, would it be 
acid or base that you should put on acne or broken skin? What do you think? Alkaline. To clean it, alkaline. But you can't leave it in an alkaline. Now, where you're thinking of the acid is on your skin. You need what we call an acid mantle. All right. Um, to kill germs. That's part of your general immune system, right? Not the specific, but the general. But the skin itself is an, al is an acid. It's a mantle that's on it. Mm. Which of what produces the acid mantle? Who knows what produces it? Think back to your skin system. You know, you, maybe you thought I took the test and now I have to think <laughs> about that system ever again. Well, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. You've got to remember it. You've got to remember it. What makes the acid? Something is creating it. Very good. It's the oil glands. It's the sebum. It's the sebum, okay? So I want to clean my face and I strip all the oil off with a really harsh alkaline cleaner. And I don't replace that sebum and put that acid mantle back on there. What's going to happen to my skin? It'll dry it out and it'll break out. And it'll break out, okay? And what you also signaled your body to do is produce more oil. It said there's no oil, we need oil, you got to up the oil production. The one thing you're trying to stop. Right. So you got to know about all the way that, you got to know how the body works, you can't work with it, you know, you can't. So the acid mantle is produced by this, okay, your sebum. So if you wash it off, you got to put it back. It's kind of like getting the Yeah. Well, or you can replace this by mixing up like a quarter teaspoon of lemon juice and like a half, maybe an ounce of water and just spritz your face. Now you can buy, what would they be called? What are they called? It's called toners, which we'll talk about in um, the hydro class, right? So what should your skin pH be? 5.5. 5.5, very good, 5.5. So you bought this really harsh cleaner and you just rinsed it off, you might want to find out what its real pH is, put a little bit on and use that pen and you'll see what it really is. And then if you think you've replaced it, like in 30 minutes or so, test it again and see if it's, if it's acid now. I mean, you can keep on top of this. That's the best thing you could possibly do if you're trying to correct a problem with your skin, is just keep up with the pH. Just keep up with the pH. Now, the, the oil that's the closest to your natural sebum is squalane. And the best source for that is shark, from the shark. But that's an endangered species now. We can't get shark oil anymore, unless you're from Japan. You can still buy it in Japan. Uh, so now we have to use one that's from olives. So they, they process olive oil, and they make squalene from the olive oil. So olive oil is a really good thing, but, but you want it in this shape. This is pretty much the exact same thing as that. And jojoba. Jojoba is the next one. And once we get through using all the oil we've got down there, we'll start using jojoba. What about coconut and palm? They're good. They're good. Not just not as. Not as, because they're not as, as close as your own natural oil. Shark's the best. Mm-hmm. So that's the, so the skin was slightly, not the skin, but the mantle outside the skin is slightly acidic. But the, but the internal body is slightly alkaline. Mm -hmm. And that's what the balance is. So it's not good for you to become acidic. There are That's studies. a bad thing. Okay, yeah. that's a bad thing when you become too acidic. Which is why it's bad for some of the people to be eating so much of acid. Yeah, it's got a big lot to do with your diet. But but some, some health conditions too make you too acidic. Yeah. They're showing, a lot of studies are showing links between people, all, like many, many, many cancer patients with acidic, you know, acid. Like, it's very, they're finding that link. So yeah, because um, when we're looking at connective tissue and all things on the molecular level, the pH is extremely important. Your body's gonna function one way uh, if it's if it's at a certain alkalinity and it's going to function another way, and if it's on a normal alkalinity, some things that normally are kept in check, like the fungus that's in your blood all the time, it can't proliferate. But you change that pH, now there's nothing to stop it. 
and now you're suddenly getting all these weird things taking over your body because now they can uh, now they can they can uh, function so the pH is real important and we eat the wrong diet and we cause ourselves to become very acidic, very acidic. so why is it so good to go and take a walk by the ocean What is it about the salt? And we'll talk about that in hydrotherapy. That's called thalassotherapy. If you do thalassotherapy, you're doing therapy using seawater or salt water. Anything to do with the ocean. Thalassotherapy. So going and doing a, a you know, bathing in the ocean, sitting on the beach, um, listening to waves, seaweed, all that falls under thalassotherapy. Well, the waves, when the waves crash against the ocean, they break up the, the sodium chloride molecules and you get a, a release of the negative ions. And along with becoming acidic, building up acidity in your body, you build up too much of a positive charge in your body as well. And you need to discharge it. So when you walk along the ocean, you've got those negative ions to reduce the positive in your body. It balances it out. So buying one of those salt lamps is a really good idea. You ever seen those salt lamps yes. made with salt? Is that what you use? Yeah. Himalayan salt. There's a really big mine, I think it's in Czechoslovakia, where most of it comes from. I mean, there's a mine, it's like miles underground. And you go under there, they do little tours, and they've got statues built of the salt and all this kind of stuff down there. But that's where most of the rocks for the lamps come from. But it puts the negative ions out into the room. It's cleansing, number one, like cleansing for bacteria and all. And it uh, helps you calm down. It helps discharge that positive ions. And it kind of, whatever's in the air, like dust particles and all that kind of stuff, it uh, coagulates and makes them fall out. So they're good. They're good to have. Uh, It just happens with metabolism, with, with bodily functions and stuff like that, yeah. Uh, and for all, that's another thing that reflexology does that people aren't super aware of, but it's also something to help you discharge your, uh, get you back in balance between the positive and the negative. Because normally, for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, we walked on uneven surfaces. We had a piece of leather on the bottom of our foot, but we still could feel the rocks and the dips and the twigs and all that, right, when we walked. And that pressure against the bottom of our feet regulated our nervous system and the electrical charge of the body. And now that we're wearing shoes with a hard sole, we're not getting that stimulation anymore. And we're having all kinds of problems. So reflexology, I mean, you can do it for yourself. It doesn't have to be someone else. I can show you how to do your own feet. Uh, but you should do it because that's a natural part of your body balancing itself, which we've eliminated. And we really shouldn't. It's a very, very important. It is kind of important, too, to be able to, to connect with the energy of the earth. I mean, people say, ooh, that's woo-woo stuff, but it's true. It is true. It is true. Yeah, don't start talking that woo-woo stuff. All right, so when you're, when you're going through these chapters, I want you to, if you see a word that you don't know what it means, I want you to look it up. And certain words in here, I want you to know what they are, okay? So when we're talking about water bags, we're talking about how the... The cells can become structured and specialized and still get the fluid that they need. Things still have to go back and forth. And also, if you read about tensegrity and you read this, the turgor, so there's a word. Who knows what turgor means? T-U-R-G-U-R. -U you need to know that. This has a lot to do with tensegrity, too. Remember tensegrity? What does that word mean? In the, in the chapter, it was used in this sentence. Collagen is to animals what cellulose is to plants, the tough lattice in which all other kinds of tissue are developed and contained. The walls of the compartments which fill with fluid to give the plant its juiciness and its upright turgor. So in connective tissue, what does that mean? I'll give you an example. You cut a piece of celery up and you leave it on the counter and it starts to curl up and dry out. You put it in water, what happens to it? It fills back up with water, right, and it straightens back out. 
So it's the pressure against the membranes of the fluid inside the cell that gives it turgor. And you need turgor. Your connective tissue is really based on the water containment that's going on. It really is. As you age, what did that chapter tell you that happens to that as you age? Dehydrate. You aren't able to hang on to the fluids like you could when you were younger. Doesn't matter how much you're drinking, you could drink a gallon a day. Your connective tissue can't hang on to it anymore. Yeah. The Chinese call it a wooden countenance. As you age, you become wooden. And you creak, do, just like a tree. <laughs> but it's the turgor you're losing, right? Your ability to hang on to the water, to keep the tissues up, right? So um, they're talking in here a lot about the properties of the connective tissue, too. Who could tell me the definition of tinsegra, uh, of uh, thixotropy? Has a lot to do with turgor. Thixotropy. Thixotropy. When the gel turns liquid. That's it. What do these three terms stand for? Is that an E or an I? I can't ever remember. I think it's an E. If I put those three words up there, you should automatically think of something. What should you automatically think of? These are the properties of connective tissue. Aren't they? This is the properties. I'm going to learn how to use the nervous system to change the lengthening of a muscle, but if I want to change the fascia, the connective tissue, I've got to know what these are to know how to change it. So what does this one stand for? She said it, but what causes the gel and soul change? Internal heat, uh, gel to soul, state. It's actually you input energy. That's what you do. You put energy into it and you change it. How about creep? It means it's a viscoplastic material. It means if I stretch it out and hold it, it'll stay in that new shape. Like if you warm up plastic and you pour it into a mold and it cools down, it's going to stay in the shape of the mold, right? <coughs> That's what creep means. <coughs> Hysteresis, what does that mean? It's a, it's a characteristic of the tissue, just like those other three. Just like muscle has characteristics, contractility, elasticity, <coughs> extensibility, and irritability. So what is this one? This one is the torgor, the matrix is going to change if you input energy. It's going to become more fluid, more stretchy like taffy. This means if you pull it and keep it into a new shape, it will change and stay in that new length. So what does this one mean? I looked it up. Tell me what you found. Um, is the time-based dependence of a system's output on current past inputs? The dependence no, you got to look up tissue. tissue. You're looking at, you're looking at uh, physics. Hmm. Well, the key term for that one is cyclic loading. The, it, it'll give up the energy. It'll give up the energy. It'll do something that we usually say melting. It feels like it melted in my hand. So I, I hold your head up and I put my fingers there and I let it just slowly come back over me. And it's lengthening as it does that. That's hysteresis. That's hysteresis. Okay. Cyclic loading. If I massage you and I do something over and over and over again, not just once, that cyclic loading of the energy input is going to change the fascia. 
Now, it never does one and not the other. I mean, it's always, you know, they, they kind of go together. But if you want to understand connective tissue, you've got to understand those properties. <clears throat> if I want to change it, i got to know how. So how does that work? How could I make fixotropy work for me? What would I do? What would I do? It also uses these properties because in different places in the body, it has a different consistency, does it? Some places it's very liquidy, other places it's hard, like plastic. Very little mobility, very, very rigid. Very, very rigid, so. But just, it's, you gotta think of it as one thing, though. It just, it just differentiates, but it's not different. It's gonna be, a, what's the basic cell in, in connective tissue? If you read this chapter, you should be able to answer these questions. Very good. They're fibroblasts. What is it? What is unique about a fibroblast? There's something unique about them. They're not like all their cells. Not like other cells at all. Did you read it? <laughs> Look on page 66. This chapter right here. 66. Of all the cells in the body, these fibroblasts are the only ones which retain throughout our lives the unique property of being able to migrate to any point in the body, adjust their internal chemistry in response to local conditions, and begin manufacturing specific forms of structural tissue that are appropriate to that area. That's amazing. Isn't it? It is really, really amazing that it can do that. It makes scars, but that's not all it does. It, it, yeah. No other cell exhibits this wide range of regenerative activity. And this makes the fibroblast the key element in wound healing of all kinds. Scar tissue is new collagen that has been secreted by fibroblasts which have migrated to the injury. So they never mature. They never become a fibrocyte. They stay blasts. This is where your matrix comes from. So the, the ground substance, that fluid, is different than all other fluids in your body. Where do all the other fluids come from? Where does the plasma and all those other fluids come from? What makes them different from this? Where do you think it comes from? Usually from what you're drinking and eating, right? It's produced that way, metabolic uh, byproducts, right? But this ground, this is from this cell. It looks like a little spider. It has little projections off it and it's crawling around all the time. And it has a, all right, what is the organelle that's making all this stuff? This is a good one. That's making the ground substance, making the matrix. What organelle is gonna make that matrix? What organelle makes things? Which organelle makes things? Remember, collagen is protein. It's the ribosomes? Not smooth. Rough endoreticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum. So just like on a spider, they have a little organ called a spinneret, right? And that's where they make, and you know what a spider web is? It's collagen fibers. That's what it is, it's collagen fibers. It is, but they, they even look like spiders, they're little, little wiggly things. Uh, but they're making it, they're making the ground substance, and they're making the fibers too. So they're being produced by this cell. They're not coming from your diet, none of that stuff, right? It's, it's a production thing from the endoplasmic reticulum. And the protein, the fibers, is the rough, right? The rough. So it can go from this part of your body to that part of your body. When it gets over here, it's gonna make a totally different ground substance and a different type of fiber. Maybe over like here, it, it, you need more elastic fibers than you need collagen fibers. So if it goes to the ear, it's gonna make it kinda like this, right? If it has to reproduce the disc between the vertebrae, it's gonna be a totally different ground substance and number of fibers. And in the, in the bone, everywhere it goes, right? Everywhere it goes. 
It never, it stays a blast. Oops, I forgot the L. It stay, you never see a fibrocyte. They're always fibroblasts because they're always making this. They're always making it. And they're mobile. They go everywhere. They go everywhere. Taken as a whole, then, connective tissue in its various forms can be regarded as a fluid crystal. Who can tell me why it's thought of as a fluid crystal? It's that ability to change, right? To change. But it's whenever you're talking about crystal, you're talking about the molecular structure. That's an array. This is why crystal is used for energy work. Remember when we talked about arrays? When they use when they're trying to, to collect signals that are very weak from space, instead of having it just one receptor, they've got a bunch of them in a set pattern, right? So the signal is bounced along and is concentrated and strengthened so they can actually hear it better. And your body does the same thing. The molecular structure of those collagen fibers is the same as in a rose uh, quartz. Same type of structure. You know, if you made a, you know what a Petri dish is? Yeah. In labs, they, they put stuff, the, the little agar gel and grow things in it. Well, if they make those dishes out of crystal, out of quartz crystal, and they let them touch, whatever's in one's going to pass over to the other. Oh my God. If they're glass, they don't do that. But things can pass back and forth when it's crystal, when it's crystal. If you're doing aromatherapy and you're testing the aromatherapy to see how effective it is on different things, and they do do that, uh, it's called an aromagram. So most, most labs are testing, you know, drugs, chemicals, and that kind of stuff, but you can also test, and they have, tested uh, aromatherapy to see which ones it's better than others. Which is the one that's the most effective? Anybody know? Okay. Kills everything. Stinks though. Because it's the terpene. It smells like paint thinner. Mm -hmm. Tea tree. Tea tree. It's a eucalyptus from the eucalyptus, but it, it's a terpene so it, it smells, you know. The best thing to wash your face. It's, it's the, the strongest of all of them. In fact, it, they've they haven't found a drug that's even stronger than that. So everything they've ever tested it against, it's always been the strongest. But, you know, it's kind of you know, smelly. It's for a lot of things. It's used for a lot of different things. It's in everything now. They put it in soap and, you know. Cold yeah, it's very good for cold sores, all that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, and you got to remember, most of the connective tissue is non-living, right? The difference like an epithelial is epithelial is all cells with just a little connective tissue, just a little stuff, little, little to hold it together. But connective tissue is almost all matrix with just a few cells floating around in it. Just a few cells. So if it's bone, it's going to be minerals and fibers. If it's cartilage, it's going to be mainly fibers. If it's blood, it's going to be mainly liquid, ground substance, right? Uh, that's always going to be the main most of the tissue is the grounds of the matrix, not the cells, not the cells. So it's going to be different wherever you find it, simply because the matrix is going to be different. And it's a little fibroblast who are making it. So a lot of your metabolic efficiency is based on that ground substance how good it is or if it's 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 more active you have more of it when you're younger and as you age like I said you dry out like an old tree and you don't have it anymore yeah all right where did all this what was the where did all this develop from when you're an embryo there's three layers of tissue and if you want to see why something relates to that where it's completely different but they they have some kind of connection you need to look at where did they grow from. It's like, what's the root of this tissue? Here I'm out on a branch, but where's the root? And that'll tell you why they're connected. So in your book, what, where does it come from? What layer? Look on page 66, back at the top.
The fibroblasts develop in the mesenchyme, okay, mesenchyme. M-E-S-E-N-C-H-I-Y-M-E. Mm-hmm. And what I've done with my pictures here, because it's kind of hard to see when he's showing you a, a piece of tissue, if you'll just highlight it and you can see it a little bit different, makes it stand out a little bit. And yeah, it's not in color, okay. But it's still up. If you studied tissue, who, what would you be called? Well, what's the, what's the medical term for tissue? Uh, they think you've got cancer, they're gonna do a biopsy and they're gonna send it to this person. So what does this word mean? Tissue. So whenever they're talking about tissue, it's going to be histo, some way or form of histo, right? So keep up with your medical terms. It will help you learn this stuff. So in those little pictures, he's showing you a picture of loose areolar tissue. And you can see all the little fibers. Um, the upper part is the ES, that top layer on the picture. Okay, that's the epithelial sheet. So that's a different tissue, right? Wherever you have epithelial tissue, you have to have connective tissue. Because the growth comes from the connective tissue where it's, where it's touching. Because that bottom layer is where you get more cells, but it has to be fed blood and nutrients and all that from the connective tissue. So you're always gonna have a layer under epithelial tissue. Mm -hmm. And then the lamina propria is under that, and then the F1s are the collagen fibrils, and the big holes every, every now and then, those are blood vessels. So you can see what they look like. They kind of look like a spider web, don't they? That, that is one thing that, I, if you ever get to do it, I would recommend it, is the body exhibit up in Orlando, because they've actually teased this tissue out from everything else and turned it to plastic, I'm not sure how. So you can actually see the connective tissue that, that's all inside and outside of a muscle. You can actually see the arteries. They took all the other tissue away and they, I guess they filled it with plastic. I'm not sure exactly what they did. So you can see the network of all the arteries. They took the lungs and took everything off and you can just see the tubes. It's amazing. It really gives you an appreciation of, of what it actually looks like when you're looking at just that. Just that. In three dimensions, absolutely. Yeah, that's where they were. Yeah, yeah you can tell they, they all are Chinese. It's kind of scary. Did you see that James Bond movie, Quantum of Solace? Was that Quantum of Solace? No. What was the other one? They had those in the. Skyfall. It was Skyfall, right? No, it was Quantum. Was it? Where he was gambling, playing poker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, whatever, whichever yeah. one it was. Uh, but he chased this, this uh, terrorist guy, and he was, um, went into the exhibit that they had in Miami for quite a while of the visible body. And he's walking around in there, and you can see all the different bodies sitting in, in different poses. I think it's only like 20 bucks to go in there, so if you ever get a chance. They, they had it down here for a long, long time, but then it closed. It was across... Uh, downtown on Las Olas and that river bend or whatever it was thing for a long time. Yeah. So osteopathic physicians are quoted in here because he's talking, he's going back to the people who actually came up with this. So R.B. Taylor on page 69, Manip manipulative, manipulative pressure and stretching are the most effective ways of modifying the energy potentials of abnormal tissues. So who does that make the best person to work on someone? Who does manipulative? Therapists. We do. We do. And that's what the osteopaths are supposed to do. They're supposed to do manual medicine. 
Because for a long time, they couldn't, dis they couldn't dispense drugs, right? And they wanted to be accepted into the medical profession. So they lobbied and lobbied, and now they can give drugs. So what are most of them doing now? Regular, you know, family medicine, that's it. They're not going to put their hands on you. You're lucky if you get to sit down for 15 minutes in their office. They walk in your room and pull your file off the door and sit down, right, and ask you, what are you here for? They're in a laptop computer, What kind of medical care is that? I would like for you to at least spend 10 minutes to look up my file and get a little reference to me and don't just ask me what's wrong with me today. That's what, the, and you're 10 minutes, right? 15 minutes at the most, and then they're gone. And what are they gonna do for you within that 10 or 15 minutes? Give you a prescription or test or test. They don't even take the stethoscope and listen to your heart anymore, do they? They don't even do that. So who's gonna do all that stuff? You. Nothing chemical or structural has been either added or subtracted from the connective tissue. Rather, by means of pressure and stretching and the friction they generate, the temperature and therefore the energy level of the tissue has been merely raised slightly. This added energy in turn promotes a more fluid ground substance which is more soul and ductile and in which nutrients and cellular waste can conduct their exchanges more efficiently. In addition to this mechanical stimulation of pressure and stretching, a powerful thermodynamic effect can pr be produced upon the bioenergetic field of the patient by the stronger and healthier bioenergetic field of the therapist. So you got the added bonus of the fact that your energy field is gonna interact with their energy field. And that's also going to have a positive effect, right? Unless you're in a bad mood, you're not taking it. Yeah, there's no substitute for this hand, right? But you have to be careful how you use it. It's power, more powerful than you think. But it can be a wonderful, wonderful tool. Uh, it's partly literal body heat transferred by your penetrating touch and partly from subtler forms of energy which such as galvanic skin responses or vibratory rhythms. Yep. This is why I like this book, because everything he's telling you, he's telling you for a reason, so to let you know what you do according to all of this. It's not a general information, it's specific to what you're gonna do as a massage therapist. How do you change someone? And it's not just something that we're, we're guessing about. You, it's true, it's real, it's, it's scientifically proven. It's not something you think, that they just feel better. I don't know why, they just do. No. What's a hydrogen bond? You should know that from chapter one before. In a, one of the first things you did was look at the chemical structure, right? How molecules are held together. What's a hydrogen bond? Anybody? Ferris? 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 Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> well, turn to page 70. All right, there's three types of bonds, right? Three, remember? Three? What's the most common one in the body? Mm, that's not a bond. That's one of them, right? Is it coming back to you now? What are the other two? Covalent. Covalent. Polar covalent. Polar covalent. Now this one can also be called a hydrogen bond. When you're talking about water, it's a hydrogen bond, right? Mm -hmm. What is an ionic bond? How does that hold two molecules together? What happens? They do have charge. In the body, they're called electrolytes. They're called electrolytes. They have a charge. These give up or get an electron, right? They give or get electrons. So they have a charge. 
They can be either a positive or negative. What's sodium? Is it positive or negative? Sodium chloride is positive, right? Uh, so you, you need to look up, and what you need to know your symbols too. If you look at the body, what's that symbol for? Potassium. So just the, 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 know what calcium is, know what salt is. Sodium would be Na. What would, would sodium chloride be? NaCl, right? Salt. Yep, salt. So what is a, a covalent bond? These, they're jumping back and forth. They're jumping. What's this one? That's where two share the same. They share it. They share it. They do a little infinity sign, right? I remember that from Dr. Kildare. You probably have never seen a Dr. Kildare. And then what is this one? It stays on one side more than the other. It's lopsided. So uh, it's polarized. So with oxygen, with water, it's H2O, right? So you got two of these and one of those. But they're not on either side. It looks more like Mickey Mouse ears. They're over here, right? It's not Princess Leia. It's Mickey Mouse. So this side is going to have a different charge than that one. So things kind of spend more time over there. Spend more time over there. So it's not an even exchange like that one would be. But you got to remember that because that's how things are held together. How, th how things are held together. Anybody know what a hydrogen bomb is? Hydrogen bomb? Hydrogen bomb. Atomic bomb. Wait, she just said the O M B. H bomb. What's happening when they split when they split the what's what's being split to create all that energy? What are they splitting when it's a hydrogen bomb? Water. Do you know that the mitochondria in your cell is a little baby hydrogen bomb? That's where they got the idea for it. Where they got the idea? Uh, nuclear physicists. And the Germans were the ones who came up for, with it. You know, they, they were the ones originally working on it. And thank God we stole it from them. And developed a little different than what they were doing, but I mean, God, can you imagine what the world would be like if they had gotten the atom bomb first? Einstein was involved in it. Yep. Oh God. And uh, you should read up on this. What people did to produce that bomb, how the entire country worked together as one, and managed to hide it from the Germans. They didn't know we were doing it. So all the women that were home, they were working in the factories. Everybody was doing everything to try to produce this. It was amazing. I think it was amazing what we did. But uh, because of thixotropic gelling effect of reduced energy potentials, right? When it's, that, when it's not able to change, it reduces its energy. It's a, not able to carry things around the body as efficiently as it should, which is going to just happen naturally from age. But other things can cause it to be worse. You can have trauma. You can get diseases. But um, it, it limits your energy, OK? Collagen fibers derive their tensile strength. There's a word. Who can define tensile? Torgor is the tension against the wall, the, the amount of fluid in there that's pressing against the wall to give it its shape. What is tensile? you're talking about collagen fibers, you need to know what tensile means. I keep my little dictionary right there, or my phone right there when I'm reading this stuff, and I look it up immediately. Because I know I need to understand what that word means, what's tensile. I keep losing my black one. Um, they, measure, they measure how strong a suitcase is, that it has a tensile strength. Like Louis Vuitton has the highest tensile strength of all of all the suitcases. So what does that mean? And collagen is stronger than steel, higher tensile strength than steel. Your ability to resist stretching, your ability to resist being elongated. Right? So if the if the suitcase can carry a lot of weight without pulling apart, that's a really strong suitcase. So. I think they're ugly as hell. Louis Vuitton's that ugly brown with that hair. 
comes. Yeah, you, they'll be, and their purses, you know, they'll last forever. But tensile means your ability to resist being pulled on. And collagen is stronger than steel. And then on page 71, he's got the whole little molecular way it's formed. Because these are little chains. These are, these are little chains of proteins. And the molecular structure, uh, it's all formed differently. You know, they're different shapes, but that's how they're formed. Collagen is the longest molecule that has ever been isolated. That's another little tidbit you should know. What percent of collagen fibers is your body? That kind of crap you should underline, you know? How, what, how much are you, how much collagen are you? And what is the molecular? It is a monopolysaccharide. You should need to know that too. Comes from the mesenchyme, from the embryo mesenchyme tissues. What are you? How much of you is collagen? 40%. That's a lot. That's a lot. How is everyone equally 40% collagen? Uh-huh. Well. Your body is made up of connective tissue. Mm-hmm. 40%. But so 40% is not most of the connective tissue. And you could have more, you could have more muscle to go with that 40% than me. I could have more fat than you to go with that 40%. You know, we can look different, totally different. But if you boiled me down, I would pretty much come out with 40% collagen. Now, there's a, there's a picture, oh, here. I really love this because it's kind of small. But it's 62 shows you two pictures of the same body part. So this is regional anatomy. We're looking at a region of the body. Here it's got everything in that region. And down here it took everything out but the connective tissue. So you can see how it is really giving everything its shape. Give it everything its shape. So the humerus is in the middle. You've got an intermuscular septum. What does the word septum mean? If you don't know what it means, you should look it up. What's septum? Mm -hmm. You have a septum in your heart. Where is it? In the middle. In the middle, right? So a septum would divide your flexors from your extensors, grouping them separately. And you see you've got the superficial fascia, and then you've got the deep fascia. What does the word fascia mean? Covering. Somebody look it up. I mean, sh that's a basic. You should know what that is. Basic, basic. What is fascia? It's, it's connective tissue. It is, but I'm asking you what the definition is of fascia. We use it all the time, but what the heck does it mean? <laughs> that was a covering, the covering of the, the four muscles. sheets on the skin. skin. The tissue fibers, primarily collagen. It's the sheets of, she of connective tissue, right? Yes. The sheets of them. So we're talking about how they form all these different structures. When they form a sheet, it becomes fascia. Fascia. Uh, in tendons and ligaments, its tensile strength is superior to steel wire. The cornea of the eye is as transparent as glass. It accounts for the toughness of leather, the tenacity of glue, the viscosity of gelatin. Invest it to various degrees with hyaline. What is hyaline? When I say hyaline, what's that? Hyaline. We looked at that yesterday. What's hyaline? It's a what? Say it, say it, say it. It's a type of cartilage, right? 
We think of that mainly when we think of articular cartilage, because that's what covers the ends of the bones. It has more of a nylon-like uh, consistency. So you mix some of that in with the collagen and the ground substance, you get a whole different uh, substance, right? A whole different tissue type. And what makes, what makes uh, cartilage? Well, what's the medical term for cartilage? Chondro. So who's making the hyaline? Chondro blasts. If the cells that are making something are always blasts, they're always called a blast. Is that still connective tissue? Yes. Cartilage is connective tissue. It still is. Okay. So all through your life, it's hardening and dissolving and moving here and moving there and changing everywhere it goes. So on page 64, if you go down to about right there, it says mucopolysaccharides. You need to know what that is when you're looking at this tissue. If I want to understand how to make it change, how it, I can bend it to my will, I got to know what to do to it. It is. Mm -hmm. Technically, we must speak of ground substance in the plural because even the makeup of this basic fluid varies from location to location. Essentially, all these varieties consist of a carbohydrate combined with a protein chain. It's called a mucopolysaccharide. That's what it's called. But the chemical variations are very complex. So you can have all kinds of different connective tissue. All kinds of different ones. Mm -hmm. I had a video I was going to show you picture here of just the collagen. I found something on YouTube that's showing you how all of this is being produced and, and redone inside a cell. It's just amazing, amazing what it's doing. And inside the cell it uses the collagen. Remember it's got a little cytoskeleton in there. And it uses what's called a motor protein. So there's some of these that actually act like a little uh, motor, like a little uh, car or something. And they grab a molecule and they travel along a pathway of one of these collagens, like a track of collagen. That's how, they're called vesicles, right? Remember vesicles? How do you think they got to the edge of the cell to get pushed out? You thought they just drifted over there? Randomly drifted over there? They're pulled. They're produced, they're laid on a track, and one of these little collagen fibers starts walking it to the edge. Walking it to the edge. Sporting it. Yep. yep. Actin. Who knows where the where you find actin? And myosin. Where do you find those two? In sarcomeres, in muscle tissue, right? Your body uses those other places too. They're what are holding open the lymph vessel under the skin. You have little actin fibers there that will open and close it. So there, there are other places too because they have that ability to work. Right. Kind of amazing, I think, that it can do that. And it's not living. It's not living material, right? It's not alive. So who's telling it to do all that? Who's organizing all this? Who's organizing all this? The brain. There's got to be something behind all of this. I mean, how can you study life and not see it? That there's something behind it that's setting the rules. That's, Setting the guidelines. I mean, this can't be just random. You can't when you really study it. If you look at a bone, which we're going to do, those little lamella, all right? You pull it out. Yeah, I've got some real bones. And each each ring it gets smaller, right? So you got a big ring, then you got a smaller ring, and then you got the little center thing. Well, this outer ring, the collagen is like this. The next ring, the collagen is like that. And the next ring, it's like that. How does, it, 
How does it create that pattern? How do those get lined up and grow this way? And then the very next ring, they line up and go this way. What's, what's directing that? Something has to be directing it, right? It's being done because of polarity. Your body uses free energy, which is uh, positive and negative, because it's free. If it's two positives, what's the energy going to be? What happens when you get two positives? They push apart, right? You get a positive and a negative, they pull together. So there's only two forms of energy, a repulsive or an attractive. And your body, that's free. You know, you didn't have to create ATP, you didn't have to do anything. So who, where did that design come from, just out of the clear blue? To me, it's just amazing. I didn't have to think about that. You know, nobody's brain created that. Oops. But it's the most efficient way to use the material. So you're going to find that all through the body if you really study it, how polarity works, how your body uses just pluses and minuses to create things, which is all a meridian is, right? Streaming ions. Streaming ions. So I have yin and I have yang. I have plus and I have minus. That's all I've got. It's just streaming ions. The connective tissue is creating the ability for it to stream. This septa and that septa, where they come together, because connective tissue is insulating material. When you looked at the nervous system, what was the insulating material on the nerves out in the body? called Schwann cells, right? And what were they making that was the insulating material? It was either myelinated or non-myelinated, right? Connective tissue. So if you want to learn about it on a molecular level, he's got it all laid out here so you can see how those little molecules assemble into a fibril. Fibril. That would be an actinuromyosin. And then it's going to form a triple helix. So look at gluing on page 73. So those fibrils can glue themselves together. They can make cables, they can make nets, they can make sheets because of the hydrogen bond. Now your DNA is a triple helix, right? What is your DNA? It's sugar, sugar molecules. But it's held together by polarity, by the pluses and the minuses that hold it into that shape, just like the collagen is here. Uh, if you ever take uh, organic chemistry, you'll have to look at this stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's creating a supportive network. So on page 75, it holds everything together. What is your skin? When you study the integumentary system, what's your skin? It's an organ. Hmm? No, what, what, what tissue is it? Collagen. That's not a tissue. It's connective tissue. It's dense, irregular connective tissue. It's covered by a thin layer of epithelial tissue, but that's not what we consider true skin. It's scarf skin. The real skin is the dermis. And that's connective tissue, right? And what's right under the connective tissue, the, the dermis? What's right under it? Subcutaneous membrane? What type of tissue is that? This is dense or regular. What is your subcutaneous? Areola. Areolar with adipose. Adipose. Yes. Yeah, a lot of adipose in there. For women, not as much for guys, but yeah. Meant to be that. Yeah. So then on 76, he's showing you a picture of a. When we study joints, which we're going to look at next, you've got different types of joints. The ones that move freely are going to have a capsule. They're not going to touch, there's going to be a space, and there's going to be a capsule around them. You've got ones that go like this, and what would those be called? In your skull, what are they called? Sutures. Sutures. Sin arthrotic, S-Y-N, prefix means together. 
so the bones are together. The other one is called an amphar throtic joint. Those are the ones with the discs in between the bones. Rubbery cartilage disc. This is called the periosteum around the bone itself. Okay. Continuous from all bone surfaces to joint capsules to ligaments to tendons to muscle sacs. Every single thing is the same sheet. Your nerves are the same. When nerves come down the spinal column and they exit to go out into the body, do you think anything changes from when, because remember they can't, they can't touch tissue, they can't touch fluids in the body, it'll kill them, they have to be protected. So what happens when they leave the spinal cord? You look at that a little bit, kind of sort of. It's like a periosteum, it's like, it's like a periosteum because it's a membrane around, what would he call it in the nervous system? It wouldn't be called periosteum, what's it called? Perineurium. Talk about nerves, right? So on the column, it comes down and it's in a sheath called the meninges. Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. Yes. If you want to study cranial sacral therapy, it's going to be all about the meninges, okay? The fluid balance inside that, the fluid balance, the hydrodynamic balance of that fluid is what you're working with when you do cranial sacral work. Then it's going to exit between the bone and it's going to come like this, right? It didn't change tissue. It's just like on a bone, it's periosteum and now it's a tendon. It does the same thing. It changes consistency a little bit, but that sheath is continuous. There's no break, because the nerve would die if there was a break, right? But we don't call it the meninges out here. We stop calling it the meninges when it leaves the cord. But it's the same stuff. I mean, it's not different, right? It's not different at all. Look at your hand on 76. So the back of your hand, you, you can see that there's no muscle back there, right? Looks like Angelina's hand. Yes, it does. <laughs> there's, there's muscle in between them, but not on top of them. So most of this down here is, is cartilage in the connective tissue in the hand. Little, little skinny muscles, long tendons in the forearm that go down. And then on the end of the finger, you've got something called the extensor expansion. It's like a little cap on the end of your fingers with all the little skinny little tendons holding on to it that tug it here and there so, so you can move your fingers. That's how they move around. So there, you can, I mean, there's nothing back there, right? It's nice and hard. But there's sheets of fascia. And this picture kind of shows you how the sheet looks. Like you see it right there? How it goes up the finger? A lot of people, when they, those things that stick out, they think they're the bones. What are the things that you feel that stick out? Well, most of it is the, is the tendon, right? The connective tissue that wiggles around? Yeah, you can see them. When we get to the hand in the um, trail guide thing, he does a really good thing on the hand, hand muscles. You want to skip ahead. All right, and look at your heart. The pericardium is connective tissue. That's what it is, okay? The meridian called the pericardium in a lot of other books is called circulation sex because it's really not dealing with the pericardium. It's really representing all of your uh, vessels, your arteries and veins and all that, right? Circulation. Then you've got a peritoneal coat of connective tissue holding the blood vessels in your intestines. Peritoneal automatically should think digestive system, right? That's what's lining the, the abdominal cavity. Mm -hmm. So it's all one big thing. And I really, this really kind of tells me what's really happening, this little, little figure with the little balloons. You take a balloon, fill it with water, then you tie it in all those different places. And that's exactly what your body is. So the muscles move you around, but they don't hold you up. It's the tension of the water in those bags that allow you to stand up and keep your upright position. 
hydrostatic pressure, because you can't compress water. You can't compress it. It's a really great thing to hold things up, because you can't. And then on 82, he shows you a very simple tensegrity structure. So we look at the skeletal system. As far as movement goes, what are the bones? They're levers. They're levers, OK? They allow you to move a really heavy object with little effort. If we didn't have bones, we would be like an octopus. We'd kind of have to ooze wherever we go. And our muscles would have to be really, really strong because it would be really hard to do. Be really, really hard to do. So bones are levers, and what are joints? Fulcrums. Fulcrums. And what does that mean to be a fulcrum? What does fulcrum mean? The word fulcrum. Where the movement takes place. Okay. Yeah. On a seesaw, it goes up and down at the fulcrum. In your body, you move at the fulcrum. You move at the joint, right? You move at the joint. So we have three types in our body, three types, three arrangements between the bone and the muscle. So here, you're going to have resistance on one end. You know, what are you trying to move? And force over here, the muscle strength it's going to take to move it. And the movement's going to take place at the joint. This one, like a seesaw, is for balance. Pivot joint is a balance joint, right? Just goes around a circle. That's some, not too many of those, but you do. Okay. What is a wheelbarrow? Let's look at a wheelbarrow. You got the body, you got the handle, you got the wheel. So that's the fulcrum. Where's the resistance? And where's the force? Yeah. Strength. That's for strength. If I stand up on my metatarsophalangeal joint and I picked all my body weight up with my calf muscles, that's that joint. That's that joint, okay? And what if I were a crane or I'm going to flex my elbow. Here's the fulcrum. Here's the force, here's the resistance. Cranes can pick up a really heavy object and swing it way far away. Range of motion. So most of your joints are range of motion lever systems. So you've got first, second, and third class levers, and you're mainly third class, which is for range of motion, right? Range of motion. So your fulcrum, your um, force, and your resistance. Think about that. That's what you are mainly. But that's what bones are. They're there for leverage. And I'm sure you've heard that before. Use leverage when you're doing your massage, right? Don't use force. Use leverage. What is the word retort? On page 83, he starts talking about connective tissue as a retort. What does that word mean? And this is probably going to show up on your test, you know, just giving you a hint. It's a, it's a container, like a glass jar or something, retort, containment. So that's what it's doing is it's containing things, right, from one sectioning things off, keeping this separate from that. So it works in uh, disease containment a lot to help keep you so something doesn't spread. And then on the next page, 84, you can see uh, planes of the fascia in the neck. See how everything is separated in little compartments? And we've been talking a lot about growth hormone, agromegaly, gigantism, all these different problems with growth hormone. A container. Connective tissue acts as a container. <coughs> Somatotrophin, that is growth hormone. This is the big thing now with bodybuilders. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's kind of scary where they're getting it from, though. You think that's people, growth hormone? No. Where are they getting it from? What uh, animal? Horse. Horse? <coughs> bovine. What's a bovine? A cow. Or a porcine. What's a porcine? Yeah, they won't say, they'll say porcine or they'll say bro, uh, bovine. They won't say cow or pig. And it really scares me when they say it's artificial. I really don't know if you can make this stuff artificially. I'm not really sure what the heck they're creating, but I don't think it's growth hormone. Yeah. GMO, you're becoming mm -hmm. genetically modified organisms. That's exactly what you're doing to yourself. <laughs> steroids are still really popular. People are still doing steroids. But they want to bulk up fast. They don't want to do it naturally. They, they're taking growth hormones now. But they say, aren't some steroids like... No, they're yeah. hmm? Aren't some steroids... At a certain level... Because I know a friend, she, her child was premature and they needed to give the child um, steroids. Yeah, if there's a reason to have them. Oh, okay. But like people who are trying to yeah. build their body up okay. are doing this way too much. Oh, okay. And one thing that always happens is it destroys your heart. You know, yeah. 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 Arnold Schwarzenegger has had three operations on his heart already. Three. But this is the latest craze. They're they're eating this stuff like candy. And the cortisone, right? Uh, if you get a chance, look back at chapter two. It's talking about the adrenal pituitary axis which has a lot to do with uh, how your body functions and the connective tissue. Mm -hmm. You know, you, when do you produce the growth hormone? No, 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 on your daily activity, what time of day is it, is it released? So if you're not sleeping good, are you getting this regenerative, you need it. I mean, I'm not saying you don't, you need growth hormone. It's what helps the body repair itself. And that happens when you're asleep. So if you're not sleeping well, what's happening to your regenerative abilities? Can you heal? No, you, you can't. They go way down. So sometimes they'll put you on growth hormone for that reason, which is okay. But if you don't, you know, you're doing it just to build your body up, you're going to have side effects you didn't think about. But yeah, it's when you're sleeping. So a good night's sleep is real important to heal, to repair your body, to get rid of stress too. I think they give those growth hormones too often to kids. Like yeah. every day, because they think kids have problems. I know. They overanalyze everything. I know. All right, he also talks about mast cells in here. Who can remember what a mast cell makes? That was part of your immune system. Mast cells. What are they going to make? They produce histamine. Histamine, okay. What's histamine? I'm probably gonna spell this one. Yeah, but what, why is it important? What, what's it for? It's part of that separation thing. You know, what happens when you have a, a bee sting? It swells up, right? Histamine is released to produce more fluids, to call in more fluid, open up the capillaries, which is going to try to keep that substance from getting into the rest of the body. And it's like a barrier that it's making. And that's part of your connective tissue's job. As a retort, you know, is also structurally all the time, but then something happens, it also creates a wall to seal something off, to keep it from not getting into the rest of the body. But he's got a, this is the an analogy almost everybody uses on page 88, is the sweater with the little hook, and you pull on one corner, what happens to the rest of it? It gets out of, uh, out of weave, right? It pulls everything else out. That's the one everybody uses. So we can see our healthy active muscles alternatively stretch and compress all the body's compartments and the cells they contain, aiding the circulation of the internal C considerably. In the same way, pressure and manipulations on the body's surfaces can be effective deep within the interior, because it's all one big sheet. So pressure and stretching, just remember that. 
That's the best way to treat the body. And who does pressure and stretching? We do. We do, we do, we do. I like his last paragraph. There is no single key in the skin, in the connective tissue, or in any other system we will examine which will provide us with an infallible means of improving health. Whatever we do with our hands must be done with the knowledge clearly in mind that all of the physical and mental elements within the human being are inextricably related. On one hand, it is the interconnectedness of these relationships which give body work its power, and on the other hand, it is the same interconnectedness which dictates the problems and limitations of each individual technique. And then I want you to read the next one about bone. This is a really good chapter on bone. It really is. Explains it. Doesn't ask you to name them, but it tells you how they form. They start off as a cartilage mold, and then your body starts impregnating that mold with minerals, depositing them, and they become hard. What is that, uh, what is that process called? Ossification or calcification. I like ossifying cartilage better. Yeah. And what do you call the little bone producers? Osteoblasts. Osteoblasts. Now what is what is regulating the mineral deposit? What regulates that? That's a hormonal, any kind of control like that of a process in the body is going to be a hormone. It won't be a nervous system thing. So who is uh, regulating that? How much goes into the blood? How much goes into the bone? We talked about this the first day we talked about the system. And you did it before because it was in another system. So where are hormones? Where do they come from? What is that collection called, though? All of them, what are they called? Huh? Endocrine system, endocrine system. So what part of your endocrine system is regulating the mineral content of your bone? Well, somebody said thyroid, and that's true, but what's doing it with the thyroid? Here's your thyroid in your throat, and you've got these little guys right here. Parathyroids, very good. Para so what's para mean? If I put that on the beginning of that word, I changed it. What does para mean? If I'm a paralegal, what does that mean? With Almost. Almost. You're, you're next to it or close to it. You're almost that. Or you're supporting it. Right. So a paralegal is someone who Assist lawyers, they do almost all the work that a lawyer does, but not quite. Not quite. So this is producing something called calcitonin, right? And uh, lots of other things too. I mean, the thyroid does a lot of different things, but that's one of them. And this one is making parathyroid hormone, PTH. I always on. So which one, uh, now you gotta think about this from the blood side. This is the whole, it's from the blood side. So the mineral, especially calcium in the blood has to stay at a constant level. So these little hormones are gonna take it out of the bone and put it back in the bloodstream or take it out of the bloodstream and put it back in the bone. So who's gonna make it go up in the blood? And who's gonna make it go down in the blood? And if it goes up in the blood, it comes down in the bone. If it goes down in the blood, it comes up in the bone. So don't get confused. If you try to think about both of them at once, it's just, just ah. Wait, say that again? Yeah. Let's just look at the blood, all right? I'm low on calcium. I need to put more calcium into my blood. One of these hormones is going to tell the little blast to start, I mean the little class to start taking it out of the bone. Or I've got too much and it's gonna tell it to put it back in the bone, take it out. You can, you can store it. Calcitonin is gonna do what? Is that gonna put more in the blood? 
Take a guess. I'll stab. Yes. 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 No. No. <laughs> Calcitonin is going to put it in the blood. The parathyroid is going to put it in the bone. Yeah. So if you think of it, you know, that's what they're doing. So constantly, the rest of your life, there's going to be this balancing act, right, between the two. And there can be problems with this when it doesn't work properly, and that's going to mess up your bones. Um, sometimes you don't have enough of the hormone, or there's things interfering with that. Or there's just simply not enough calcium, and your bones get really, really brittle. It's taking it out, but you, you really need it. You know, it's taking it, but you really need it. So. so what do you have to do as you get older? And there's another hormone that also plays into this. Who knows what that is? Estrogen. Estrogen. So it's got to be that little cocktail, right? It has to be just right. Yeah. So he's got just black and white pictures, but he shows you the spongy bone, how it looks like Swiss cheese. And then on a molecular level, why those little collagen fibers are laid out the way they are. And the way it, um, it starts out in something called the perichondrium. What does that mean? As it's developing, it's starting out in a little structure called a perichondrium. Perichondrium. So I might ask you a question about bone development. Bone development. I'll give you a study guide, but you know, this is what you should get from this chapter. So around the cartilage, it organizes itself into a collagen membrane, which encapsulates the cartilage model. So bones start out as a cartilage model. An embryo, they're not hard in the embryo. They only get kind of solid just before they're born, and even then they're kind of rubbery, right? The babies are kind of rubbery. They're rubbery, yeah. They don't get hurt. They just bounce against the floor, yeah. So it produces a high concentration of chondroblasts that continue to add to the surface growth of the cartilage model. So at this stage, it's called the perichondrium. And uh, you can call it two ways. You can call it calcification, or you can call it ossification. They, they really mean the same thing. I think ossification is more accurate, but nobody asked me. So you can talk about it either way. It just means that they're changing from cartilage. They're depositing minerals and becoming hard. So the little osteoblast, what he's doing is he's producing the ground substance and the minerals, the collagen fibers, and then the body, those hormones, are bringing in the minerals and they're being deposited into the collagen fiber. The collagen fiber is what gives it its strength. It's like when you lay concrete, you put that metal mesh in there, or you put the rebar bars in there to make it strong. So if you don't have the collagen fibers, you've got an eggshell. An eggshell is just the minerals cracks real easy, right? That disease, uh, ossificans imperfecta, that means they don't have the collagen they need. They have the minerals, but not the collagen, so their bones break very, very easily. So the process of calcification and of hollowing, the perichondrium remains as the tough, tightly clinging sheath, which surrounds all surfaces of the bone. From the time of actual bone formation onward, this membrane is now called the periosteum. So now it's called the periosteum. Mm -hmm. And on the inside surfaces, it's called the what? Endosteum, right? You should know that one without even thinking. Mm -hmm. Endosteum. Uh, it lines the blood vessels, nerves, bone participating osteoblasts. It's analogous to the bark of the tree with its inner cambrium layer, which carries the sap and which manufactures all the new cells which add to the girth of the trunk. So that, the periosteum has much to do with the shaping of the bone within, as it did, the original cartilage model. And it continues to shape the growing bone. Long after the cartilage is gone, you still got the periosteum. Remember we talked about the bunion? When that periosteum pulls away, what are those little blasts going to do? They're going to fill in that space. That's their job, so you start. Now, if, it, if it's, um, what would be the medical term for um, 
a bone spur. I've got arthritis and I've got these little spurs growing. What would, what would be the medical term for that? Anybody know? Well, it's going to have os or osteo in the name, right? Because we're talking about bones. Osteoclassification. They're called osteophytes. Physis or physis, epiphysis. Physite means growth. So an epiphysis is an over, the growth at the top, the overgrowth. A diaphysis is growth in the middle. Di can also mean middle, right? So whenever you see that epiphysis, that's what it means, growth. So an osteophyte is a, is a form of that word. So it's bone growth, abnormal bone growth. So on your, you can get them on your spine. You can get, what would we normally call them? What would we call them? We wouldn't say osteophyte. What would we say? Bone spur. We'd say a bone spur. But that's, that's the same thing. So the lay term would be bone spur, and you get them with arthritis, right? You get the ugly knuckles. What makes the rheumatoid arthritis all malformed? What happened there? They don't have, it's not bone spurs, it's not osteophytes. What happened with RA? Remember we talked about that yesterday. What happens with RA? The, the, sorry, the joints are completely malformed, aren't they? <laughs> It's that space inside that capsule. They get inflamed and the body puts down collagen to try to form a scar. And it kind of pulls them apart. They get soft and squishy and they get full of that collagen and they just completely deform. So this part still is the same. It's this part that gets all crooked, right? It's very painful too. I've worked with some RA patients and it's, it's not a nice thing to have at all. And it's really difficult with juvenile because they, they have a lot of problems standing. And they really don't want to do exercise because it hurts, you know. It's hard to get them to do things. But the, the less they do, the more stiff they become. So they gotta, they gotta move. It's hard to get them to do that, though. So if the periosteum is torn, growing bone slowly spills out of the tear in irregular globs, like pitch from a gash in a tree. If the bone has all the periosteum taken off completely, the bone decays, it dies. But if you don't break the periosteum and it's still got blood going into it and it still has some osteoblasts, it'll regrow. This is one of the questions that you, you might run across and I, I want you to understand this. Um, one thing I didn't talk about with the bone and I should have, anybody know what an epiphyseal plate is? So, before puberty, bones get longer, right? They're constantly getting wider and thinner throughout your life, but they only get long up until puberty. <clears throat> and the plate is where they're growing in length. It's right there, okay? It's called apositional growth. So it's growing from this side and from this side. So it's getting longer, okay? Up until a certain point, now this is cartilage, until it goes all the way across and it ossifies, then the bone doesn't get any longer. So they can look at an x-ray and see if that bone is going to grow anymore, right? If that plate is still there or not. What if you, that's a weak point in the bone, right? What if a child breaks the bone right there? Well, you can ruin your occipital and stop and have it sort of be, one of, the one of your arms can stop growing if they break Yeah, the bone. exactly, you exactly. Have one arm here. We have someone here that had that happen. His one arm is much shorter. One of the questions that somebody said was on their exam was, if you had an epiphyseal fracture, would the bone grow anymore? The bone would not grow anymore. Two faults. What do you think? What did I just say? If the periosteum is still intact, if there's still blood supply, if there's still osteoblasts who are active, it will, it will heal, and the bone will continue to grow. So it's false. I mean, in some cases, yes, it will happen. It won't heal properly, it won't grow any longer, but it's not a guaranteed thing. It doesn't always happen. If, as long as there's blood and as long as that periosteum is there and there's some osteoblasts that are active, it'll heal. It'll heal and it'll continue to grow. Now in the nervous system, what is a very similar thing? You cut your arm, you cut the nerves too. How did that nerve reattach and now you still got feeling in your fingers? What happened? What would have to be there for that to, to regain the nerve? One thing, if you don't take higher up A and P's, you don't learn that there is a Schwann cell, there is a membrane around all the nerves. 
that encases them. And as long as that's there, as long as that tube is there and intact, and there's a blood supply, it'll heal. It'll heal. It's slow. I mean, it takes time, but it will heal. Okay. So as long as there's something there to protect that from the outside, right? You can get something called uh, reflexive dystrophy RDS. Huh? What is it? RSD. RSD. What is it? Reflexive sympathetic, sympathetic dystrophy. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine had this. I worked with a guy. He was a um, electric um, exercise physiologist, and he was also a policeman. He started as a policeman. And he went on to college. So he did part time, you know. And he was out walking with his wife one night, and this Doberman pincher ran at them and started attacking them. And he held the dog at bay by putting his arm out. And the dog bit him. And it got all the way down to his ulnar bone. Made a big hole in it. <clears throat> if you ever get a bone break in the marrow, if it's in the marrow in the center here, and that gets inflamed, everything doesn't work right anymore. And that's called um, RSD. RSD. <laughs> the bone, the, the arm will stop after being um, you don't have, and he had to stop being a policeman because he couldn't grab a, a gun anymore. He couldn't keep the grip on the gun. This is his right hand, of course, right? Yeah, he had operations and they tried everything they could think of. So it's real important that you don't get infections in here. And if this gets infected, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. So his periosteum was obviously opened from the bite, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I was just going to say, that's yeah. good, yeah. To, to protect it, but, um, but they said that's, he's, he, they said they're wide open, so he, his, he was kind of short, and they said he's going to have a massive amount of growth at one time, and that's what happened. He was like, this tall forever, and now he's yeah. tall 6'2". Yeah. And they were going to give him growth hormone, the <gasps> doctor wanted to, and I said, no, and he said, well, you know, he's going to be, you know, 5'8", and I said, so? <laughs> that's fine. And he said, mom, I don't want them. And um, the doctor said, you know, he's just, you know, and um, he's almost six two. Mm -hmm. and stuff. But they, <laughs> but they said that the doctor said that he should experience pain from just walking because his growth plates were so. It's open. very unstable, you know. The, the yeah. cartilage, the weight can just shift around on that. So yeah. Really and uh, pain from the bones—that's the most. You have yeah. most pain in your skeletal system anywhere. Any slight little thing that's wrong with them, it hurts like. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, the, the growth hormone for, for kids that are real small. Sometimes it helps, but um, you can't really, you can't really um, tell exactly what's going to happen. You don't know how the body's going to respond, so you're kind of taking a shot in the dark there whenever you mess with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, some fact about the bones, some are entirely shaped by the capillaries that are surrounding the membrane and there's no original cartilage model. Most of the bones of the skull, the jawbone, and the greater portion of the collarbones are formed solely by the activities of the periosteum, which in these instances needs no previous cartilage model to follow. So what would be a good question? Let me see. Does the clavicle form from a cartilage model? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Say yes. What did I just read? Yeah, no, it doesn't. Listen to it. Listen to what I just said. Some bones are, in fact, shaped entirely by the capillaries of this surrounding membrane, your periosteum, 
without the benefit of an original cartilage model at all. Most of the bones of the skull, the jawbone, the greater portion of the collarbones are formed solely by the activities of periosteum. So a good question would be, is there a cartilage model for the clavicle? Yes or no? No. How about the jawbone? Look on page 98, the very last paragraph. It's going to give you the examples of the ones that are formed by the capillary, by the periosteum. And then his picture looks very much like my picture, right, of the, of the osteon. But he's got, I kind of like this better. I Maybe I should put this one. He's got the little lamellas pulled out, and you can see how the collagen fibers are going in different directions in each little ring. In each ring, okay. This is better than mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his, this is an older book. <laughs> it's an older book. Yeah. Well, I can't really say that. He, this is his third edition. I forget when he did this one. But he hasn't changed that from the original one. Now, what you need to know about Dean Juan is he does have some things on the internet. I think you have to subscribe to it. He's got like a library. It's not much, like five dollars a month, but um, and there's one I can show when we look at further on with the muscle, where he's talking about the nervous system and how it controls the muscles. He's on one of these sites, and he's it's, it's, he's talking about what's in the book. But the way he describes it in person, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I like this here too. He who what kind of therapist is he? He's kind of like the guy that wrote the trail guide. Do you know who he is? What is he? Is he what profession is he? He's a massage therapist. And let me tell you, I, I here we get the, everybody looks down on us. Trust me, the nurses, the PTs. We're not a real profession. They are. And the, the woman who, who runs the PTA program here, she was so excited. She was telling me about, about the book. And I said, yeah, I've been using that book for quite a while now. She said, we're using it now, too. And did you know the author is just a massage therapist? Isn't, that, a massage isn't that amazing that he could write this book? I'm just standing there looking at her like, don't stop her. Don't stop her. Yeah. I, oh. Well, how are you exactly? You know, that, that shows a lot of uh, empathy there, lady. <laughs> so that, yeah, and I just go, yeah, you know, that is amazing. Deadpan, right? Deadpan. <laughs> Can you just imagine? <laughs> he is a massage therapist. Now, he was um, in the process of getting his PhD. I can't remember what for. If you know anybody who's ever tried to do that, it's very, very hard. And after about the third year, he quit. That's enough. He had enough of that. But he is a Traeger therapist. Anybody know what Traeger is? And he trained with Dr. Traeger. Traeger's the Traeger's the Traeger's the the um, Traeger is all about rocking. It's working with the, the cochlear, the inner ear. It all comes together. Um, I know a couple of therapists in the area. I don't know if they come out and do a class or not. I can ask, but the, but there is a lot of Traeger therapists down here, and they have a little organization that they they are part of down here. So if you wanted to take it, you know, you wouldn't have to travel out of the state to take it. You could take it here. It's rather expensive the way they've got it set up, though. You have to take you have to take. A, treatments and do all this other stuff, it's like a thousand dollars before you can even start doing this training. Wow. It's going to be two or three thousand before you are completely done with it. Yeah. But it's all about rocking. It's shaking and rocking, the whole thing. And he also does something called mentastics where he's, it's a mental change along with what you're doing. So it's mental exercises. Now that's a fine line for us as therapists, whether or not we can do that whether or not that would be considered therapy. 
saying things to them, you know, to change the way they think. Yeah, he was an MD, so <clears throat> that part of it I don't do, just because I don't want to have any question about what am I doing, you know, I can't really, and you, you start off saying one thing and their response and that will determine what you say next to get them to stop. What you're trying to do is to get them to not be armored anymore. If someone has armor, what does that mean? <clears throat> you're tightening your muscles in response to a psychological problem. It's psychological why you, you tighten up the way you do. And to get someone to reduce all that, you have to change the way they're thinking. Now, if it's an actual energy and, and you're an injury and you're trying to protect it, it's called guarding. You know, I don't move my arm because it's going to hurt, so I, I adjust everything in my body to keep me from having to move that space. But if I'm always anxious and I'm someone who carries that in my shoulders, I'm always going to be like this, right? There wasn't anything pathological that went wrong with my little nerves or my sarcomeres to make me do this. I'm, my thought pattern is making me do this. So if I can break through all that, my whole body's going to let go. And that's what, men, that's what mentastics is about, is doing with that. And that's uh, kind of psychology yeah. stuff. So I, I just try not to say anything when I'm working on somebody. I don't engage them in a conversation because I don't want to ever come back that I'm trying to uh, counsel them. I'm being a therapist. I don't want to do that. Yeah, and I'm sure he does it because out in California, it's a whole different ball game in California. You know, that's where the term touchy feely came from, is out there. Because after your massage, you all end up in the hot tub, nude. You know, it's different out there. It's kind of, kind of goes over the boundary. Yeah. But he is a, he's a Traeger therapist. He worked for many, many years at the Esalen Institute. Did you watch Esalen videos? Yes, can I watch it again, please? I, I love it, I love it. Uh, that's where he practiced. He taught and practiced there. But I think now he's got his own clinic somewhere else and he's doing more, more traveling and stuff like that. But he was there for many, many years. Dr. Traeger taught there at Esalen for many years, yeah. And that was one of her bonus questions, to know who he was. That was one of your bonus questions. How'd you do with the bonus questions, by the way? The names? Did you get them? Yeah. Yeah, I got them. I mean, I, 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 didn't, I don't think I got mine graded. I didn't need them, but I got them. Microgenesis? Who was that? Brown. <laughs> no, you didn't. Brown. Uh, Robert Brown. Microgenesis? The Chinese lady, Mei Wan Ho. The cell biologist who studied connective tissue and the energy system. Oshman, Dr. Oshman. His books are fantastic, by the way, if you want to read them. And then um, Sweet Science. Who? who? Oh, that's Blake. Very good, William Blake, yeah. And then Traeger was the doctor and taught fantastics and, yeah. Yes, I did. In about five minutes, ten minutes, we'll go downstairs. I don't forget. Um, so on page uh, 101, I think there's a really good picture of the cartilage growth, the epi epiphyseal plate there on the end of the bone. One one. Both osteoblasts, which build bone, and osteoclasts, which dissolve it, are always in continual operation. The drawings indicate their finely coordinated efforts, which allow the bones to grow in length more than they grow in bulk. The continual process also allows the bones to adjust the body's levels of free calcium. Uh, what is one of the things that calcium is used for in the body? Why do you have to have it? You go into the hospital, the first thing they're going to do is take your blood, stats, and they're going to check the calcium level. Why? With your why, what's it doing at the heart, and why do you have to have it for your heart? You learned a little bit about muscle, right? You looked at tissue? Yeah. All right, in the cell, you know about the sarcomeres. But what is letting the calcium out to change the polarity of the sarcomere to shorten those fibers and cause a contraction? It's one of those actin or one of those two. Um, I remember. It's called a sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
It's like the endoplasmic reticulums, but in the, in the muscle, they're storing calcium. <clears throat> and when the electrical impulse comes along, it releases the calcium, which changes the polarity in the sarcomere, which allows it to contract, right? So if your heart's gonna keep beating, you have to have calcium, right? Yeah, they don't want your heart to stop, so they, they keep track of that really closely. Because muscles won't work right unless you have calcium. And your heart's one big muscle, right? One big muscle. So if a bone has plasticity, what does that mean? If it has what? Plasticity. 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 In a healthy, full-grown adult, it is primarily the load placed upon the bone which determines the stimulation and the balancing of osteoblast and osteoclast activities, thus establishing the thickness of the bone walls. If a person habitually carries a heavy weight on the same side, say a heavy purse, that's why I do not want you carrying your purses or the backpacks, okay? The walls of his or her vertebrae and the supporting trabeculae will thicken on that side. You see the little old guys like this in their 80s? Did they start out looking like that? No. They started out looking like this, right? <coughs> Plasticity, like I told you, you pour something in the mold, you take it out of the mold, it stays the shape of the mold. I start putting a heavy shoulder purse on my side and I carry that for 20 years. Everything has changed on that side of my body. Now I look like this, right? And it really won't go away completely. I mean, you're never gonna go back to that young spry look once it's become that far along. This is one of the axioms. It's called Wolf's Law. You need to remember this, Wolf's Law. I have a sheet of them I'm gonna give you. If I want to change something, I got to know what the rules are of the game. They're called axioms or laws. Wolf's law states that your tissues will change according to the forces acting on them. Muscles will get bigger if I start lifting weights. They'll get smaller if I stop. If I put something where the body has to build up resistance to that force, it will change in response to that. That's Wolf's Law, okay? The one that we use the most is Sherrington's Law. Uh, if I do tapotement like this, is that sedating or stimulating? Stimulating. Deep and heavy and slow is sedating. Sharp and fast and light is stimulating. I'm doing tapotement both ways. But I'm going to do it different if I want a different result, okay? And if I don't know the rules of the game, and if I thought this was stimulating, I'm going to have a problem trying to change the body, right? I got to know what works for what. And those are axioms. They're called laws and rules. One thing about, we're talking about how the heat changes the connective tissue, even a slight change. That's von Hoff's law. Anybody know what von Hoff's law is? Yes, I am. I have a machine. For every change in temperature, my metabolism is going to respond to that change in temperature. If I raise the temperature, is the metabolism going to slow down or speed up? What do you think? It's going to speed up. But if it's it's just a change. So some people say, well, heat's going to work better than ice. But ice is going to change a bigger degree, a bigger change in temperature than heat will. Because ice, because cold penetrates deeper. Heat's only going to go back two inches, and that's it. And it's going to dip, dissipate very quickly because heat is not good for the body. It denatures protein. The body only uses it for fever. Normally, you do everything you can to cool down. You sweat. You do whatever, right? If I put an ice pack on and I leave it for 20 minutes and it, it, it may be four inches, the change in temperature when it heats back up 
that rise in temperature is going to have a more of an effect on the metabolism than if I used heat to start with. I'm sorry, can you repeat what the Vonthoff's law is stating that for every change in the temperature, every degree of change in the temperature, there's going to be a 10% change in your metabolic rate, which is a big change. Now pH, guys, pH is on an, uh, what do you call it? X, X, Exponential. Exponential. So for every change, like one degree change, it's a hundred times what the one was before. Yeah. So if I change the pH three degrees, what's that, 3,000 percent change? Yeah. So it's, it's a, a very huge, significant change. very, very significant. So when they're talking about, you know, a half a, a half a pH being a really bad problem, now you understand why. That's a big change. You go one or two degrees, you have really changed up. So if you go up from, say, 5.5 .5 on the skin, just maybe to 6, that's a big change in the skin. That's a big change. So this is going to determine how the body's going to respond to temperature. And that's all what hydro is, right? When you're studying hydro, it's really all about using changes in temperature to change how the body functions. We use water because water is the standard for heat exchange. Specific heat. One degree of heat will raise one gram of water one degree at one atmospheric pressure. A lot of people leave that off. The atmospheric pressure, it's going to be different if you're up on the, the Himalayas than if you are down here. It's going to work different if you're at sea level. So where you're at is also going to change how that works. If you're up in the mountain, is your water going to boil at 212? No. No. You've got to have a higher temperature, right? But that's, that's called specific heat, standard. And water is our standard. We measure everything else against water. That's why you're going to, you should use water for everything if you want to get a really good heat exchange. All right, your brain is fried. Let's go. Speaking of heat, we do have hot packs. You know, if you guys want to use them, you're sitting up here in the back. It hurts. This, what is the safety thing about them? Don't lean on them. Don't lean on them. So you put it on your back, you can't lean back against the chair. 